Welcome to Tibbetts United Methodist Church. My name is Betsy Wharton, and I'm the worship coordinator here at Tibbetts. And whether you're joining us in person here in the sanctuary or via live stream, we are glad you're here. Know that you're loved by God, and we uh, welcome you this morning to a time of worship. If this is your first time worshiping with us and you want to learn more about how you can participate in the ministry and the life of Tibbetts, take a moment to fill out the yellow contact card that's uh, right in the pew in front of you. Um, and later on in the service, uh, and drop this in the offering plate in the back on your way out. Um, later in the service, we'll also be uh, sharing our joys and concerns and I'll be collecting these green prayer cards during our centering music this morning. So if you have a prayer request um, or a joy you'd like to share with the congregation this morning, please fill one of these out and I'll be collecting them just a few minutes. If you're worshiping with us online, you can also go to our church website and subscribe to our weekly announcements. Your presence in worship here is a gift to us, whether you're physically here or here with us online. Pastor Sarah is traveling this week um, to attend a funeral, and we're excited to welcome our guest preacher, Reverend Colin Cushman. Pastor Colin is currently appointed as the director at, of Camp Indianola. He lives at the camp with his wife and daughter and loves being able to live in the midst of nature and wildlife at the camp. Welcome, Colin, and thank you for being with us today. Please join me in an attitude of prayer while we center our hearts for this hour of worship. Gracious God, gracious God, you reach out and lift us up when we trip. To set us back on our faith, you shelter us in your grace. When the storms of fear batter us, you open your heart to welcome us. When all the world's doors slam in our faces, make us aware of your presence within us and among us. Ground us in your spirit of truth. Amen. Please stand, whether in body or in spirit, and join me in the call to worship. We watch as the seasons change, soft rain nourishing the earth, cool breezes cradling falling leaves. All creation reminds us of the delicate artist who has shaped us and all that is around us. 
We lift our songs of gratitude and awe to you, O God. God humbles our arrogance with acts of mercy and laughs at our hunger for power words of grace. The Spirit unfolds the road map to show us the way to the kingdom and transforms our hearts to offer praise and wonder. the time for young disciples come on up hi friends I don't know if I don't even know if you go to school but if you go to school do you have something called a line leader at your school what does the line leader do? It's okay if you don't remember. It might just be a name. But the line leader is the kid who gets to be in the front of the line. Yeah, exactly. Like the little blue truck who leads the way? Just like that. Exactly. So it's pretty good to be the first kid in line, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the Bible story today, Jesus is with his disciples, like usual, and two of them come to him and they say, 
Jesus, we want to sit on your right hand and your left hand. We want, we want to have the best spots. We want to always be the line leaders. And he tells them, well, I can't promise that. And then the other disciples find out that they were asking to be basically first in line all the time. And how do you think they felt? They were kind of mad. And Jesus said, don't worry about who's first. All of us are here not to be the most important and have people serve us. We are here to help others, to serve others. We, the person who's last, who makes sure everything gets taken care of, that's the person who will be first. So when you go out in your, in your week this week, I want you to be thinking about how you can be serving others, how you can be the last making sure that everything gets taken care of instead of being the first or the most important. All right, I think Rachel has Sunday school if you want to go off with Rachel. Thank you so much, friends. Bye. The gospel reading today is from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism, excuse me, with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or to sit at my left is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them, but it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man may not be served, excuse me, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God.
Well, folks, as uh, I was uh, graciously introduced earlier, I'm Pastor Colin Cushman, uh, currently appointed as the director of Camp in Yanola. Um, and uh, Pastor Sarah gave me the uh, great privilege of being able to share with you guys at this point a couple of things just about what's happening around Camp in Yanola to be able to um, share that with you. I don't know if you guys have ever had this experience, but if somebody comes from an organization to do guest preaching or something, you're like 10 minutes through the sermon, and then you realize, oh, this whole thing's just been an infomercial? Oh, come on. Uh, I, I don't know about y'all. I find that really frustrating. So fortunately, I'm able to share a little bit now, and then we can uh, dig into the uh, scripture passage that we're looking at um, in, in a few minutes. Uh, so camping, you know, one of the things we had a camping season this summer. It went very well. It was obviously modified for COVID. Um, we have no clue, of course, what's coming down the pipe. We, we'll see, and we are really looking forward to um, being able to be of help to our kids and youth, however we're able to in this time. Um, but one thing that I really did want to share with you guys as well is that we are really starting to become more than just a place for kids and youth for summer camps. Um, we are really working to build up and develop our adult spiritual retreat programming. And so um, these are retreats that I'm going to be leading. Uh, we're going to be having three different series. Um, and they're, they're weekend-long retreats that are really designed to help people grow deeper in their faith. We have Diving Deeper into the Bible as one of the series, Seminary for Everyone, and um, Retreat as a Spiritual Practice. And so we are going to be really um, trying to help people to grow deeper in their faith over these weekends. Um, we have, uh, I have a couple posters uh, out in the lobby if you want some more information, or of course you can find much more information and sign up on, at campaignanola.org slash adult dash retreats. Um, and then just finally, I wanted to let you know that we are also going to be beginning to start volunteer weekends regularly, three times a year. Our first ones this next weekend might be a little short notice if you, uh, if you weren't planning on it already, but we're gonna be doing these regularly, have this great time with a lot of folks who care about helping make this a really great experience for kids and for adult retreat goers um, to be able to have a safe, wonderful, nurturing space to connect with God and connect with one another. So thank you guys very much for allowing me to share just a little bit about what's going on at Camp in Enola with you guys. Um, and thank you.
Holy God, when despair knocks at the door of our souls, awaken our hearts to tenderness, enliven our minds with creativity, and meet our bodies with rest, that we might be fortified to co-labor with you to bring about your kingdom. We dedicate these offerings to the invigorating of our spirits and to the ministry of our discipleship. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 7 and 34 through 41. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings so, so, that, so that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who, who has the wisdom to number the clouds? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mast and the clods cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion? Or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God of the sparrow, God of the whale, God of the swirling stars, how does the creature say ah? How does the creature say praise? God of the earthquake, God of the storm, God of the trumpet blast, how does the creature cry woe? How does the creature cry save? God of the rainbow, God of the cross, God of the empty grave, how does the creature say grace? How does the creature say thanks? God of the hungry, God of the sick, God of the prodigal, how does the creature say care? How does the creature say life? God of the neighbor, God of the foe, God of the pruning hook, how does the creature say love? How does the creature say peace? God of the ages, God near at hand, God of the loving heart, how do your children say joy? How do your children say Once again, thank you so much for having me 
uh, with you this morning. We're going to be reflecting on the book of Job. Uh, rumor has it that we have been looking at that the last couple weeks and which, wish to continue to do this. And so the book of Job, as you may or may not remember, is this book in, typically called a wisdom book in the Bible. And so we're, we're just to situate ourselves, for those who might not be as familiar, so we're talking about the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, so we're talking about before Jesus, um, and we actually don't know exactly how far before Jesus. It's actually quite a bit more confusing than on typical books with, with this question, but we have these authors who we will refer to as the sages, these wise teachers, the sages, who write this subversive wisdom book. It's a very odd book for being wisdom because instead of the typical tropes that we hear throughout much of our wisdom literature, we have these very thought-provoking and very, very um, curious ideas, as, as we'll dive into a little bit about what was exactly so subversive about this, uh, this material from today. So, if you will with me, uh, I'd love to look with you a little bit today at, so what even was in this passage, and try and get our heads wrapped around that before we figure out um, what exactly we make of it as 21st century Christians, and why we should even care about it. So we, the passage we heard today is about, let's say, 95% of the way through the book of Job. So we started off with this lovely prologue, this framing story, the bet between God and the accuser, and then we have this going back and forth, Job and his Job and his uh, so-called friends, let's say, um, going back and forth trading verses. Uh, if, I don't know if you all are familiar with this, but it, it seems a whole lot like a rap battle, basically. You've got going back and forth, taking turns, and trading off, trying to make their points. And, and eventually, they, and they dwell this in poetry, by the way. Um, so going back and forth, trying to wrestle with Job's situation and make sense of this, this quandary that they are faced with of what do we do in the light of innocent suffering? How do we make sense of this theologically? And of course, Job is insistent that he has done nothing wrong. He's not to blame. He is not at fault. And his friends are equally as insistent that yes, he is. And I have no clue why, but you must have done something, and you definitely deserve it. Now, our passage today comes in, as I said, 95% of the way through the book. We are almost done with it, and we have this new character introduced into the story, God. You may have heard of this character before. And actually, God's been surprisingly absent from the book. Not, not, no, not so much. They've been talking about God the whole time, right? But even at the beginning, where there's the wager between God and the accuser, God still just kind of lets it happen. Doesn't really do much. And then God disappears as a character in the book. Until, until now, chapter 38. 38. And 95% of the way through the book, they've had what's by now this tiring repetition between trading off verses, and then God breaks in. There's this eruption, this breaking in, this deciding, all right, you guys have been talking long enough, it's my turn now. And going back to our theme of the rap battle, God starts God's defense and uh, a defense it is, and, and very much in the theme of the rap battle, it is filled with braggadocio, it is filled with one-upsmanship. And so God, it, it, like, listen to this at the very beginning, God answered, gird up your loins like a man. Let's go. Let's go. You want, you, you're, you've just spent 36 however many chapters 
trying to slam me. All right. All right, let's go. And so God's like, okay, well, well, we'll start easy. We'll start easy. So um, tell me, where were you when, you know, I made the earth? Oh, you didn't exist? Oh, oh fascinating. Um, well, can you even do something easy like um, uh, make a flood happen? Oh, you can't? Oh, really? Can you, um, uh, can you make a thunderstorm? Oh, no. Really? Fascinating. And just God keeping coming back again and again. And we, we skipped like two-thirds of the chapter, y'all. It's it just example after example after example of, hey, you know, there's this, there's this, there's this. Huh, how do you measure up? Hmm? Hmm? You keep, you keep coming at me, I'm going to come at you. And so God keeps coming back, keeps saying, you, who are you, huh? Who are you to question me? So ultimately, remember, what is the question they're trying to, what is the question of the book of Job? What is this whole argument about? Job said, I don't deserve this suffering. And what is God's argument? What, what does God say in terms of why does Job deserve this suffering? God doesn't say anything about it. <laughs> like, it doesn't even address the question, right? It's, uh, to me at least, this is pretty unsatisfying, right? We, we've, we basically, we've got who are you to ask questions? You need to just sit down and zip it. I mean, didn't even respond. And so, to the sages who were writing this, who were reflecting on this question of the problem of human suffering, especially innocent human suffering, and the deservedness of it, their solution to that problem was, you're not God. Sit down and be quiet. Now, <clears throat> I'm curious to take a poll real quick. So quick show of hands. So for how many people is this answer satisfying? The problem of evil and suffering is, dunno, don't ask me, God's God. Anybody? Nobody. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, me neither. Um, I, now, of course, when I frame it like that, it's slanted, right? Okay, so, I mean, what, so, if we're being more fair to the authors, one thing that they are reflecting on as well is this human finitude, this, this, la this fact of being human. Part of what's baked into the fact of being human is that we don't have all the answers. We don't have all the knowledge. We can't do everything. And so perhaps the author is just reflecting back to us that maybe we need to be more humble of the fact that we don't actually know everything in the world. We can't, in fact, control everything as hard as we try. But regardless, the answer still boils down to I don't know, God's God as the answer to why are you suffering? So for me, I, uh, to me, in my taste, this response does not hold up to the questions that we are bringing to it. To me, this response leaves some things to be lacked. But Notice what I had mentioned before about this being a subversive wisdom book. I do, I do not, indeed, think that that is all to this story. Because who, according to God as portrayed by the sages, who got things wrong 
We had an argument going on for chapters and chapters and chapters between Job and Job's friends going back and forth. Job arguing, I'm innocent. The friends arguing, he must have done something to deserve it. So who is wrong, according to the sages? So Job's obviously wrong. I mean, God's confronting him. So the author obviously thinks Job's wrong. But here's the subversive part. And it's outside the bounds of this chapter. But God also says, it doesn't, it doesn't even engage with the friends. So not even, not even I'm going to take you on and do five minutes of battling with you, like with Job. It just said, God said they were wrong. And brushed them aside. Right? Not even kind of affording the respect of a real battle. Right? It just kind of, oh, wow, no. Heck no. Those are way out. So notice what's subversive about that. Because what were the friends arguing, right? The friends were arguing the conventional theological wisdom of the day, the conventional way of understanding God, the way the world works was this idea that you will get what's coming to you. If you do bad, you're going to get bad stuff to you. If you do good, you're going to have good stuff happen to you. And if you thus, like Job, had something bad happen to you, then therefore, you must have done something wrong. You must have done something to deserve it. And this is the conventional wisdom of the day. And not even just conventional, this is what the priests are saying. This is what the public religious figures are saying. This is what the analogy to the pastors are saying from the pulpit, right? They are preaching this. This is well known, established how you think about God. And what do the sages say? No, they're not wrong. We don't, we don't even accord them the dignity of fighting with them. Just brush them aside. No, of course that's wrong. Of course that's wrong. I'm not even dealing with you guys. Right? And so, not only does Job hold his own in this extended argument against his friends, who are saying the thing that everybody clearly knows to be true, but the sages, the author, is saying, you know what? That doesn't even hold water either. So why do we care? What, what, what do we take from this as modern day 21st century Christians? I mean, for me, I wouldn't personally argue that we should particularly take the sage's answer as to why does bad things happen to good people. I don't, I don't particularly find it all that satisfying to just say, I don't know. You know, but one thing that I think that we can take from this is that the author does present some guideposts, some, uh, some, uh, some boundary markers, if you will, a and cautions us of, I th you know, I think this might be too far in one direction. When we're trying to figure out this difficult, if not impossible, question of why does bad things happen to good people, Eh, that one doesn't fly. The friend's answers of, you must have deserved it. Eh, that doesn't fly. That's outside of the boundary markers. The sages also provide a boundary marker for Job, right? On Job's argument and saying, eh, that doesn't fly. Not just him saying that he's innocent, but remember him almost trying to overdo it. And... God's remind, in God's comeback, as unsatisfying as it may be to me personally, I, there's still this sense that there is this awareness of the human condition, the human finitude, the human, the human lack of knowledge, of understanding, of fallibility, of nobody is perfect and you can't be. And so there's God kind of taking Job down a peg, if you will, to remind Job everybody's human. Nobody's beyond messing up. Not me, not you, not Job, not MLK, not Mother Teresa, not Gandhi. Every, everybody is human. 
that is part of what it means to be human, is to be faced with this finitude, with this imperfection that is gloriously imperfect. And so these authors here, even though we may not like the idea of just be quiet, don't ask questions, that the author seems like they may ultimately push for, the author still does present some helpful guideposts for us, some boundary markers for us to help us think about this question of suffering and especially undeserved suffering. So friends, may we today, how about for our benediction here, let us have a two-parter. May we both, may you not follow the sage's answers and stop questioning and stop doubting. May you not do that. But also may you neither succumb to the other extremes that the sage warns against, of certainty, of forgetting your finitude, and forgetting others' finitude, and responding to it with compassion and charity. May it be so. in the sight of the Lord, Lord, and he he shall lift lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. Higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Friends, we've reached our time uh, for sharing our prayers with one another, um, our joys and concerns that are as a part of our church family. If you would respond to these, um, Lord, loving God, we give you thanks, or Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uh, prayers for healing and comfort for our sister in the hospital. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayers for the family of our district superintendent, Reverend uh, Derek Nakato, on the death of his mother this weekend. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ongoing prayers for the Gill family as they prepare for their daughter Josie's brain surgery on November 17th. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Iris Steinhoff is in hospice in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Would you join me in a moment of pastoral prayer? God, thank you for 
the chance for us to be together, to share with one another those things that are in our hearts and on our minds, in our lives, in our world. We left up to you those things, spoken, unspoken, and ask for your peace, for your healing, for your care, for your wisdom, for your comfort. We thank you for those things in our lives which give us joy, which give us wholeness, in which we experience love, both others and yours. We thank you for those things. And God, we ask for your hands holding us as we experience those things in life that we do not get joy from those griefs and sorrows and tragedies. And God, also make your presence known in those in-between moments in which nothing much is happening, in which things are fine. Help us to remember that you are with us at all times. And help us to be able to live into that life to which you have called us. And so God, hear us now as we join collectively in the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, now and forever. Amen.
Announcements this morning uh, before our sending forth. Um, next week, Pastor Sarah is back with us, and we are thrilled to welcome a special guest speaker, um, Annabelle Quintero. Annabelle was on the 46th floor of the World Trade Center on 9 11 and will speak with us about her story of hope. She's written a book called Step, Step, Jump, and in addition to joining us in the service, she'll also be joining our intergenerational book club that meets via Zoom that same afternoon at 1 p.m. So if you would like to join that, please go to the Tibbetts website, and you'll be able to see the Zoom link so you can join and uh, interact with her a little bit as well. Um, our outreach team, as you see in the foyer, is sponsoring our um, sock Socktoberfest, <laughs> it's a big, it's a mouthful. Socktoberfest, so um, through the month of October, please bring new white socks um, that will be distributed by Operation Nightwatch. And then this upcoming Saturday is when they're hosting the welcome table again. We do that about once a quarter. And um, so this Saturday is the time when we prepare hearty meals for people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and so you can be in contact with Keely Bazakis, who is our uh, ministry coordinator for that area, um, or you can go to the Tibbetts website and look and see how you can donate monetarily there under the Give tab. Um, and now, uh, one last word about when we exit the building. Um, we're still staying safe and keeping one another safe, so please, as you rise, if you can go through the building and out either the front or the back and uh, join together in, in uh, fellowship um, outside so we can stay safe. Um, just know that the end of this month, the leadership team is meeting to reevaluate our covenants. And so you may be hearing about some changes, but in the meantime, I'm really glad that it's not raining yet again <laughs> so we can enjoy some fellowship. And now Pastor Colin will do our sending forth. May you go forth into this crazy world that we inhabit, bringing with you the love of God for you and for everyone. Go now in peace. Mm -hmm.